All right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Hopefully you all had a good lunch out there and uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we are here at There and Back, a network automation journey. I'm Eric Thiel. I lead developer advocacy for the DevNet team. Uh, and what I'm going to talk to you about today is setting a little bit of a baseline. So a lot of you have probably been to some talks talking about how the industry is shifting to automation, to net DevOps, all of these things. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a start, how you can approach this depending on where you're at. So I know a lot of you are probably at different places in that journey. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those phases. Uh, I'm just kind of curious as a show of hands, uh, those of you out there, um, how many of you have done any level of automation of your infrastructure already? Okay, good handful. Uh, anyone consider themselves fairly advanced in automating already? Okay, one, one hand. So it, it is going to be a fairly introductory level just to set that expectation, but hopefully some of the methodology is useful even if you've been doing this a while. Um, I'll talk about some stuff that I've seen work at customers when I've worked with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, we are silent disco, so if you see my lips moving and you can't hear me right now, talk to someone to get a headset. If you see a neighbor not wearing one, nudge them and let them know that that's why they can't hear anything. Uh, if you have questions, uh, try and get my attention. I'll come out and that way I can repeat it, the question into the mic uh, so that everyone else listening on the recording will be able to hear it. So, all right, with that, let's jump into it. Uh, remember, we do have a WebEx Teams room. Feel free to join that through the app. If you want to have any interaction, clearly not while I'm on my session, but afterwards you can reach out to me, ask me questions about anything that I covered, any general questions. I can give you pointers of places to get more resources, et cetera. So feel free to hit me up. I think we're in there for at least a couple weeks afterwards. I almost never leave rooms once I'm in them, so you'll probably reach me indefinitely into the future. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to myself. Uh, I'm going to talk about Automation Exchange, which uh, this time last year was not yet launched. So I'll give you an idea of what that is. Uh, it's something that DevNet launched. I'll talk about some methodology on brainstorming ideas. As you're starting to figure out how to get into the automation, how to start taking that next step from wherever you're at, I'll give you some ideas on that. And then we'll talk through a methodology that I use and, and we use as part of Automation Exchange called Walk, Run, Fly, and how you can actually use that to gradually progress through this journey. So first things first, who am I and why should you even bother listening or should you just catch up on email? Um, I've done a lot of different things throughout my career, going back uh, further than I want to acknowledge, but I've been a DBA, I've done security pen testing, I've done Novell admin, network admin, system admin, et cetera. Um, and it was interesting when I built this slide uh, for a deck about a year ago, I thought about where I've gone throughout my career and the interesting thing is through all of these uh, roles, at some point programmability has played a part of it. And it's always looked very different. So uh, in that first one, I was a Novell admin and we had MS Mail. And I used Excel to automate a bunch of tasks of synchronizing uh, address lists. But it's interesting that I've always found a way to automate and I've always tried to find a way to do things in a more repeatable fashion. So that's what really drives me and makes me passionate about this is I I'm lazy, I don't want to have to do the same task every day, but more importantly, I want to make sure that if I'm out for a week, someone else comes in, I've built them a process that's so repeatable that they can't do it in a different way and mess things up how, how it should be. So it's always very predictable and resilient. And that, frankly, is one of the biggest values to me of automation in general is you know you get predictable output always. So, automation exchange. Uh, we sat back and looked at the industry as a whole. We see this shift going on. Um, some of you might be familiar with Code Exchange, which is a, a curated repository we have of GitHub repos where we help go out and find repos that we think would be interesting to networkers. So they're probably involving some sort of Cisco technology or an ancillary technology that might have useful code if you're going to go start coding against infrastructure. But what we wanted it to do is take it to the next level. We wanted to say, okay, that's great. We got a lot of functional code or code samples or tools or other uh, automation tools out there. But we wanted to actually approach it from the customer perspective of you as a customer are coming to us and saying, I have a problem. How can I solve this? So Automation Exchange takes a lot of those same code repositories and approaches it from the perspective of what is the problem you're trying to solve here is some code that solves that specific problem. Now that problem might not be exactly what you're trying to do, but if you go out there and search through it, you might get inspiration and say, that is a problem I have. I'm going to go pull down that code and customize it for my environment. 
I'm going to talk on a few different slides about this methodology that we put when we, when we went into it, but at a high level, what we wanted to do is figure out, because all of you raised, different ones of you raised your hands for how far along you are, we want to make sure this is appealing to everyone. So we have these walk use cases for people just getting started. You need to start somewhere and you're not going to jump in feet first usually. You need to get, your, get used to it, understand how it might work for you. And then you might progress on to a run where, you know, walk, we're talking about getting visibility and insights. Maybe you're just doing some reporting on things, you're getting alerting on things, uh, things that aren't going to break the network if you goof up because you're just getting started. When you move into run, you start doing things like, I'm going to take some basic automation steps. I'm going to take a task that I would perform as a human, and I'm going to just start doing it with a machine. It allows me to interact with the machine, make sure that it's doing what I expect. It's not really fully autonomous yet, but it's doing a lot of tasks that are repetitive for me. And then finally, as you get really robust, and I was talking to a few of you, you're doing that already in other environments, uh, but Fly is where you can start doing CI-CD pipelines and have automated changes where if you need a new VLAN across all your campuses, maybe you just type in that number in a text file, save it, and the rest happens automatically. It knows to push it out to all your campuses, all your switches, et cetera. So you can get to a very robust system, but that shouldn't be the first project you ever do. Please, I beg of you, don't make that the first project you do. If you go out to Automation Exchange, and I didn't actually put the URL in here, but you can go to developer.cisco.com slash automation. Um, but you can approach it in a lot of different ways. Um, things that you can do is maybe you have a specific kind of a problem. So you're working on a telemetry project and you want to figure out what's out there. What have people done to get better telemetry off their infrastructure? Or you want to just figure out how you can automate a lot of, you have 10,000 devices in your network. How can I do things at scale? So you can kind of drill in via one of those. Or you may just say, I have a new project where I'm deploying DNA Center. What automation have people done over the top of DNA Center? So you can drill in via that. Or maybe you have a certain tool, you want to work with Puppet. Maybe you drill in via that and see what code samples people have done using that. So we've, we've sliced it in a number of different ways. We've all, also done uh, life cycles. So day zero, day one, day two, day n. Um, maybe you're saying, I'm doing a brand new deployment. Well, let's look at some day zero use cases. Or I'm doing life cycle refresh because I have a lot of old gear. Maybe you're looking at day n. So no matter how you're approaching it, it's a great place to go and just get some inspiration. Or you can just go view all use cases and browse through. We have about 75 of them out there right now. It is a community contribution site. So if you have code that you've written and you've published out on GitHub, uh, all, all we really do is we make sure it's got a license that is open source so that we know that we're, you're all free to use it. You can pull it down and use it however you see fit and that it's well documented. So if you have a project you've been doing and you think it might apply to people and, and solve a problem that other people are having, we'd love to have you contribute as well. Uh, but if you're just getting started, go out and check out what other people have done. And the best coders out there aren't writing tens of thousands of lines of code per day. They're good at searching and they're good at customizing what they find. So where do you begin when you're just starting to get in automation? You know you really want to tackle this or you're being told you have to tackle this, is, as is the reality in a lot of organizations. How do you actually get started? You have that site, great, you can go find some inspiration, but how do you figure out what might work well in your environment? I already talked about the kind of level of complexity methodology I use, but this is something I worked with a lot of customers on is figuring out, uh, think to yourself where you're at. If you're already automating a lot of things and you have a team that has some software development skills, then you're probably going to pretty quickly progress through some of these. But I always en encourage people, get started down on this end. Try things out and it's very easy to grow and add on capabilities as you get comfortable with where you're at. But before you even get there, one of the keys is you got to figure out what your inspiration should be. What problems should you be tackling? And there's an exercise I do with customers um, that I think is, and I should say I used to do with customers. I did change roles about a year and a half ago and I was working with a, about 130 customers and I would do a lot of one-on-one -on -one workshops with them. But this is something that's easily repeatable for all of you. Um, and it was just a simple brainstorming workshop. If I, have any of you done design thinking workshops before? We've got a section over here. If you like some of the stuff you're hearing, I highly encourage you to check it out. It's actually right through there. But they'll take you through some of these methodologies in a little bit more depth. The gist of it is um, getting a collection of ideas from people and then figuring out how to prioritize things, figuring out where the hot spots are. Um, but I wanted to throw this quote out here is that perfect is the enemy of good. 
when you do this, as I'm talking through this, if you go off and do it yourself, try not to filter things early on. It's pretty key that you let everything get out there. Don't judge people for what they're saying. Don't dispute what they're saying as being a, a problem. But you want to get as much info as possible and then work backwards from there. So what the exercise I usually did was literally just a whiteboard and I would go and I'd get the whole IT team in the room or a bunch of network engineers in the room or whatever, whoever I was working with at that point in time. And I would just say, give me all the problems you struggle with. Tell me what causes you, or what takes up the most time every day for you and or uh, what is the most error prone for you um, or what do you just not like about your job? When you show up or when you wake up in the morning, what are you thinking you really just don't, you want to call in because you don't want to have to deal with? Those are three really good things to capture. And again, remember, don't think yet about whether it's doable in programmability or not. Just get them all on the whiteboard. And you just start jotting it all down. And this is an example from one workshop I did, just a subset. You know, usually I get a few dozen things in each workshop. But you can do this in you know, your team meeting on Monday and say, okay, I spend a lot of time managing access lists on a firewall. You probably, anyone that manages a firewall spends a lot of time managing access lists on it, I can pretty much confirm. Um, or you're struggling with software versioning across all your infrastructure. That's a pretty common one. Uh, you have 100 devices that you, that you manage, or 1,000 or 10,000, and when you need to make a change, a new NTP server or something, it takes a lot of time. Uh, maintenance, uh, after you do a maintenance window, you have to go back and test and make sure that nothing's broken or else you're going to get that call at 3 a.m. saying, yeah, whatever you just changed broke something. So what if you could uh, streamline that? That would be a useful tool. Um, or you need to go through and do an audit for ISO and you need to make sure that all your passwords are compliant or you need to make sure that you're not allowing unsecured transport for, mod for managing devices. All of these things are pretty common across customers. But get them all on the board, spend 10, 15 minutes with your team just jotting everything you can down, but then give everyone a Sharpie and say, okay, go up there, and depending on the size of your group, everyone make a mark next to one or three or five or however many, and as they all go up and mark which ones are most important to them, you kind of start seeing a pattern forming of what might work well in your organization, what might be a hot spot or a problem area. Um, so in this case, if I look through, I can see what kind of ideas we had. Well, this one had a lot, and Technically, it's actually a really useful project. Uh, software image management is a very challenging thing in most organizations, but it's fairly advanced. Like, if you're going out and rebooting routers and uploading files and changing boot variables, is very prone to a problem where that doesn't come back up and someone's got to drive somewhere. So, not a good choice for your first uh, project if you're just getting started out. Um, this one, though, this is interesting. Testing after a maintenance window it's great because it's a read-only project. So remember when I talked walk, run, fly? That is a perfect walk example because every one of you, after you do a maintenance window, you probably do a few things. You ping, uh, that's the number one troubleshooting tool out there. Um, but maybe you just ping from your host. You don't ping from every router to every other router in the network. You probably don't check the BGP tables to make sure that no routes have added or deleted that you didn't expect. But if you're doing it programmatically, you're no longer bound by how many commands you can type and how well you can look side by side. So that might be a really strong candidate right there. Or you need to audit and enforce configs to make sure you have you know, secure password policies and whatnot. Well, the management starts getting into that, uh, the run area where you're actually going to make changes, but you could do an audit in a read-only mode. So maybe you could just start out by saying, I'm going to go across all my devices and figure out which ones are conforming to my baseline standards and then you can grow on it from there. Remember, I mentioned it's a spectrum, so it's very easy to start something in a read-only mode and then progress, say, okay, well, now I've, I've, I'm comfortable with it, I'm gonna now make it do more. So as you're going through, uh, those examples that I mentioned were just a few that I heard in most customers, but here's some things to think through as you're doing that brainstorming is, uh, in the walk category, I typically consider things like visibility and insights. So you want to get stats on which interfaces are taking errors, or you want to know when links are flapping, things like that. You want to grab ongoing telemetry information in a read-only manner. You want to do auditing of compliance and making sure, you, you could probably sit down with all your top architects in your organization and say, these are 50 things that should exist on every iOS XE device. And these are 30 things that should exist on every NXOS device. And if they aren't there, that may not be everything, but those 30 and those 50, if they aren't there, that's problematic. I'm going to get in trouble, or if I go and make a change, I might lock myself out because that user doesn't exist and I assumed it did. 
So go through and think through those kind of use cases or um, gathering information. If you have an outage, what if you could write some automation that could empower your knock to very quickly start gathering info? So when you get the page at 3 a.m., by the time you fire up your laptop, you get your air card on, you VPN in, it's 10, 15 minutes later, the problem might already be gone. But if you could actually automate just gathering information, you're not going to break anything, you're not going to make it worse, but suddenly now maybe you could do root cause analysis after the fact because the knock has already clicked that button and started the collection. Um, so these are all great places to get started when you're just starting your journey. Now, how do you decide how to actually do this? If you're really just getting started, you probably, are, you probably don't have a set of tools defined yet. So there's a lot out there. This isn't a class on any particular tool, but I'll talk through a few that I like in the uh, walk space. Um, and I know I just showed icons, but you can kind of figure out as I talk through them. So I mentioned Ansible to a few of you uh, before the class. Ansible is a great tool if you don't know any coding, if you don't have any background. I really like it because you can very quickly go out and maybe grab some examples off Automation Exchange and just try it out. Like if you just want to back up all your network configs, there's one out on Automation Exchange. You could pull it down, put in all your IPs and passwords and just run it and it's going to go. And you're not going to break anything. Probably. No. Um, but there's also tools like Puppet. If you're already using Puppet to manage devices, that might be a good choice as well. They do have agentless support now for a lot of Cisco platforms, so that could be a good option. Python over here, if you already do some coding, Python's a solid choice because there's a lot of libraries out there that work within a Python to make it easy to interact with devices. Some of those are Napalm. So Napalm's got a very good connection-oriented system, so you could define a router and, and tell it what you want to happen on the router without saying, send this command, type these three characters. It's a little bit more intelligent. Um, PyETS is another one. Has anyone heard of PyETS or anyone using it? Um, I really like this one. If you're going to go the Python route, I really encourage you to take a look at that. And there's actually, over in our demo, our automation journey down that way, you can actually see it in action. But it, it's something that Cisco uses internally. So every time we do a new build of software, we have to regression test. We have to make sure that the environment, if we load it, uh, load the new version of software that we're testing, that BGP still has the same number of neighbors, that we still have the same interfaces up and down. We want to make sure that nothing changed between versions, because if it did without any other changes, something's probably wrong with that code. So they actually built this internally to handle that. It, go, it goes and it can scrape the screen, it understands the tabular formatting on all the different versions of iOS. So when you say, I want to understand what routes are in my routing table, you don't have to go and try and find what IPs and figure out that it's an IP address. It does all that. And it, it uses it in a programming friendly language. So all good tools. The interesting one I put up here is DNA Center. Not necessarily considered a programming tool, but for a lot of customers, if, if you want to do automation, and it's fairly off the shelf use cases, that could be all you need. Maybe you just use that and use some of the built in tools from that. Like you don't want to go, you don't want to go to the extreme right away. If this solves the pro all of your problems that you come up with in that whiteboarding session, like don't build your own. Don't invest time, like we have thousands of people that work on this product. You don't need to necessarily go build something else to compete against it. Um, so maybe that'll work. And NSO is another one. Uh, they also have that over there. It's a very robust tool for uh, large organizations to do things at large scale. So I'll talk through an example of one that I see uh, that comes up in discussions a lot, and that's state validation before and after changes. So I kind of alluded to this already. When you go in and do a maintenance window, usually what you do is you go through and do some show commands on, a, on the devices that you think are going to be impacted, probably put them into Notepad. Actually, I'll do the build. You save all that into Notepad. Now you go and do your maintenance window, 2 a.m., whatever time. You're done at 3. Now you spend another two or three hours SSHing into each of those devices again, doing all the same show commands, and then looking at two Notepads side by side. Right? That's, I, I did this for a long time in, uh, in the actual field. That's always how it went. And it was very painful and very error prone because I wouldn't notice if one IP address changed. I'm not going to notice that at 3 a.m. when I'm looking back and forth. So it's a pretty interesting use case to try and automate. The nice thing is, even if you've never coded in your life, PyETS has a, has a particular uh, capability called Genie. And it's a CLI-based uh, program that does a lot of that kind of stuff for you. And I'll show a demo at the end here. But what you can do is you can do a Genie Learn and say, Genie Learn Routes. And then you do that beforehand, you do all your changes, and then at the end you do Genie Learn Routes again and do a Genie Diff. And it's going to tell you what routes have changed on your devices. 
So instead of a manual steering compare, you could feed it a thousand devices, and no human's ever going to be able to do that, but you can now suddenly test things before and after that you never would be able to do efficiently as a human. So I think that's a really cool use case. So here, like I said, you just run it before, tell it to learn whatever you want it to learn, you do all your changes, you run it again, and look at the difference and figure out if you've got a problem. The other one I mentioned is something like an ISO audit. So usually how this goes is, once a year you have an auditor that you pay a ton of money to come out, and they're going to ask you for configs off of every one of your devices. And that means someone is stuck SSHing into a thousand devices, grabbing configs, and then when the auditor comes back and says, well, what about this device? You're going through and doing it again and doing all these manual steps. It's pretty tedious and it's point in time. So a day after the auditor leaves, if you change something and you're no longer compliant, it might be a year before you realize it. Pretty painful process. And the remediation is painful too because you're going through and manually saying, okay, well, these three devices are missing their password policy. Now I've got to schedule ma three maintenance windows and go do it. So from here, good sets of tools might be something like Ansible because it natively understands configurations. It can very easily do diffs. So you can say, these are 20 things I want set. Tell me if any of them aren't set. And you can go the step further, and I'll talk in a minute about that. You can then say, okay, well, go ahead and set them. So once you get comfortable with it, you can actually go to that next level. But for now, maybe just use it to audit. Same thing, Puppet, Napalm, Python Native can all do that as well. Just depends on what tool you're most comfortable with. So now in this example, I'm going to talk about Ansible. We can do that exact same step, except instead of me connecting to 1,000 devices and grabbing those configs and checking if I have these 30 lines of code in it, I'm going to just tell Ansible, here's the 30 things I want on every router, and I'm going to tell it, okay, if that's compliant, then mark it green. If it's non-compliant, tell me all of the exact commands that need to be typed on every router, and maybe I tell it to open a ServiceNow ticket and say, I, for every device, and this device needs this remediation, this device needs this remediation. Maybe you don't trust programmability yet, you're still getting started, so you'd leave that for engineers to go and actually do the remediation but you can then use Ansible to validate after they've done the remediation. Or, once you get comfortable and you start moving into the run phase, great, I've looked at all those tickets that have been opened, I really trust Ansible's got the right idea, it understands what I'm trying to do. So you can maybe move to the run phase where you actually say, okay, now I actually want it to push configs. I want it to start doing scale, uh, device config changes at scale and uh, Maybe I'll do a validation step in the middle, but I'm more or less trusted to do those things. You can do things like self-service. You could say if customers want to, if you want to enable a store branch to be able to add a new SSID, maybe you give them a portal and they can type in the SSID name and all the rest of the automation is done, so you know it's got the right security levels, but you're empowering them to kind of do some self-service provisioning. But most, first and foremost, and what I mentioned at the beginning is, it can really help you ensure that you have consistency and simplicity across all your domains. So you know that every VLAN is within this numbering scheme, and you can always check to make sure a VLAN is not reused in multiple different uh, platforms, for instance. Same tools are very useful. I did add one in here, NSO, and what I really like about NSO for this is if you're trying to do state management across a large environment, um, we're talking thousands, tens of thousands of devices, service providers really love this. It can do, it can understand your current state and you might have a lot of snowflakes. Every environment might have slightly different configs. You, as long as you're happy with where it's at, you tell it, okay, this is my current state, I want it to be like this, and you can have it alert you anytime anything changes. And then maybe you accept those changes, maybe you tell it to auto roll back those changes, you can decide the behavior but it doesn't assume, like if you do something in Ansible, you're kind of assuming that everything's the same, what you're putting in there, or you're building a custom Ansible per device. NSO is really great because it can learn your current state and then just tell you what's changed from there. So this workflow is pretty much the same as what I showed you before, except now we're gonna actually tell it to let it remediate. So I'm going to have Ansible go and connect to my devices, check those maybe 30 lines of standard config. It's going to log it either to non-compliant. I'll probably have, still have it open the ServiceNow ticket for accounting, and I will log the before and after state. But then I'm going to actually let it go and do the changes. Okay, I trust Ansible. Go ahead and push all the changes, make sure everything is exactly the same, everything is fully compliant, and then log the after state into that same ServiceNow ticket and close it when you're done. 
So suddenly you've got a very easy workflow, you've got full accountability, so if something breaks, you can go back and say, what was my before and after, and you know exactly what it's done. But think of the man hours involved. If you have a thousand devices in your network and you need to go through and check 30 things, how many weeks of how many people's time is that going to take to do? And in Ansible, it's just a matter of you kick it off and let it run. Um, and depending on how big the box is, it will determine how quickly it'll get through that all, but it's not a human sitting there typing a bunch of stuff. That's very error prone, by the way. We are very fallible as humans. Lastly, Fly. So Fly, like I said, is where you get really robust. Uh, if you're just getting started, which most of you indicated you are, you're, you're a ways from this. I want to set that expectation, but you can start doing some really cool things. Like, for instance, if you want to proactively have devices be able to be managed, if you spin up a new application, maybe that application can request a certain amount of bandwidth from the network. So you could actually have some actually machine-to-machine self-service. Um, or a new branch comes online, maybe it can request that it be provisioned into your SD-WAN. You can build a lot of those workflows. Um, you can also start getting into machine learning, where I've talked to a lot of organizations about, if you have an internal knowledge base for your NOC, it still takes a human to take that call and read through and say, okay, this looks like the problem, last time we did this to fix it. What if you started training your automation to do that? Say, if you see this log entry in any of your switches, you know that condition means that we're running out of memory on the switch and we need to take this preemptive action. Maybe it just alerts someone, maybe it actually goes and takes a preemptive action. Or if it detects uh, that we're dropping packets on the WAN, it can connect to the provider and increase your, your WAN bandwidth, for instance. Whatever that may be in your environment, you can actually start making some, you can train your script to say under these conditions, take these actions. So it can really become a member of your team at that point. Same set of tools can be very useful. Um, this one I added GitHub. So GitHub could be handy because I, I alluded to this earlier on. What if you just want to be able to provision VLANs very quickly and easily? So in this case, we use something like VS Code, a text editor, to have a list of VLANs. And this is my list of 20 VLANs that I want to exist in the data center. And you have a new app coming online, you need five more. Well, maybe you just add those five numbers at the bottom of the text file, save it, it gets put out to GitHub, and GitHub knows anytime that changes, I'm going to check the state of the network and make sure that that is instantiated on all of my devices. So that could kick off a workflow. I'm still using Ansible because it's still a pretty straightforward use case. Ansible already knows how to create VLANs very well. So I'm going to say, hey, Ansible, here's my list of 15 VLANs. Make sure those are the only 15 VLANs I got. It kicks it off. It goes and updates all the VLANs on all your devices. It will update them both on NXOS and UCS, so you have it all in sync across all your platforms. And then again, maybe you're logging into ServiceNow so you know what's been done. So those are kind of the walk, run, fly progression and talking about how you could start small, you could start with something that goes and audits your network, but you let the humans look at it, say, yeah, I want to do that, I'm going to go paste those configs. Then once you've done that for a while, great, take that next step. Start build the trust within your organization, because a lot of people are scared. They say, you know what, if you automate this, what if you do something wrong? Yes, it could melt down the network. This is the reality of what we're doing. We're trying to do things at scale. Doing something wrong, you can also do at scale. So once you get comfortable with it, once you've tested it and tested all the possible failure scenarios, move into that run where you actually let it do the config changes. And then start learning, okay, well, under these conditions, I want to do that. Now we're going to progress into fly eventually. So I'm going to take now, I'm going to jump over and show you guys an example. And perfect, I left myself enough time. I will mention, for those of you that are starting to get the itch to wander your next session, I do have stickers, but you do have to stay to the end. So if you want the new Devi sticker, you will have to stick around through the demo. Uh, but it's, it's pretty quick, and I think it's a pretty, oops, pretty interesting demo. So I think it's worth sticking around. And again, what I'm showing you is examples of stuff that you will find out on Automation Exchange. So if you like some of these, go out and start searching and you can actually go and find very similar code or even some of the same code out there that you could try in your own lab. You could try it in the sandbox. How, oh, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with DevNet Sandbox in the audience? That is not enough hands. Uh, okay, so they are set up, I believe they're right over here. No, they're right over there. Um, DevNet Sandbox, we actually have, if you pick any Cisco platform for the most part, we have a sandbox that lets you go out and try your code on it. So as you're starting this journey, you don't have to go and buy a bunch of gear. 
if you want to test out NXOS, we have an always on. I can hit it over the internet and I can try sending API calls against it. If you want to try ACI, DNA Center, iOS XE, iOS XR, all of that stuff, we have always ons. We also have reservables. So maybe you want a topology of a few devices. You can actually reserve one for up to a week and go try it. No charge, it's all free for all of you. Um, but it's a good way as you're getting started, you can go and dabble in it. And if you, if you know you're going to break it really badly, do a reservable because those reset. Um, the always-ons are shared. So if you change the password, everyone's going to really dislike you and you're not going to be able to use it for a while until we fix it. Um, but they're great platforms to go out and just experiment and get, get the feel for how some of this stuff works. So the first thing, I talked a little bit about Genie. Um, so I'm going to show you just how easy it is. In this case, all I want to do is I want to use Genie to monitor for changes in my configurations on a bunch of devices. In my lab, I have four routers. So that's what we're working across all of these with. But the command is as simple as saying Genie Learn Config. I could choose Genie Learn Routes or BGP or Genie Learn OSPF, whatever I want. I just want to know the configs. I'm feeding it in testbed is my list of devices in my network. I have four, you could put in 4,000 if you want. Um, and then I'm telling it where to output it. So I'm going to output it to an old directory, so I know that this is before I've done anything in this demo. And all it's doing in the background is it's going to SSH out to each of those four devices, grab the config off of it, and save it to a text file in a directory. It does take it a few seconds to run. There it's done. and. Just to show you what it looks like, I should have done a directory before, I'll show you now. I don't have a new directory in there, so you'll see that it, this, isn't, uh, this is a live demo. Um, so now, if I go and look at the old folder, I have a bunch of different files. What I care about is ops, and what it's done is, remember I mentioned that it understands things like the tabs and spacing inside of our, our CLIs? So it actually has taken all of the config output and put it into a JSON format so that you can actually more programmatically access that information. Um, but this is just my running config. It's got a host name, it's got interface configs, all the configs within it, all of that. So nothing too exciting there. So we're going to leave that be for a little bit. That is just our before snapshot. Now I talked about, for a good walk use case, that config auditing. And you've got to worry about compliance. So what we're going to do is we're going to run an audit script. And this is a playbook that says, here, and actually I'll open it while it runs. Um, all it does is it says, here's some things that I want in all my environments. So I always want to make sure my time zone is set to West Coast time um, on the US. I'm going to make sure I have timestamp logging. I'm going to set the domain name. I'm going to make sure it's got RESTConf and NetConf APIs enabled, a certain set of NTP servers, et cetera. Whatever your environment may be, you can do that. Maybe it's a certain set of usernames and passwords you want, or you want to make sure that certain usernames don't exist. But what I did is it went out and SSH to each of those devices and checked all of those different configs, and it's telling me what's wrong. So I fed it the dash C, which means check. It's not going to do any changes, so there's nothing I can do with that if I'm doing a dash C that would break my network. <clears throat> and dash V is just verbose, so it's going to tell me what exact commands are missing. So as I look through, it doesn't go in order. It doesn't. Uh, it goes in whatever order it com completes in. So on router number three. Looks like I'm missing my time zone setting, a timestamp setting, and one NTP server is missing. On router four, I'm missing the time zone in an NTP server. This one, someone's really been going crazy on and changed a bunch of configs. But so far, all it's done is it's told me what's wrong. If I'm in my walk phase, I'm probably now going to go in and manually remediate those. I probably have a notepad template that I can go and paste on all four devices and run it again and make sure it worked. But because I've tested this now across my environment, all of those look reasonable, I'm actually going to go ahead and actually get rid of the dash C, which means I'm telling it, Ansible, go ahead and make sure that all of my devices are compliant. So it's going to now find any differences and change them and make sure that it's matching. You'll see here, it says changed if it thinks it had to make a change. Um, if you're running check mode, it thinks it's got to make a change, but it, I don't, I'm not allowing it to. But now this time, since I'm not in check mode, it actually went out and made these changes. So I'll, uh, my session disconnected. But we w it said we were missing, on router number one, we were missing three of these NTP servers originally. It told me it needed to add them. So if I do a show run include NTP on this one, now I can see I have all four of them in there. So that Ansible script now has successfully pushed changes out to my devices and confirmed that it was successful. 
if it couldn't reach the device or if it couldn't apply the configs as I stated, it would have given me warnings and I could have taken actions accordingly. I could have said, okay, try again, or I could log a ticket and say, someone's manually got to remediate these devices. But now that that's done, remember before we did a Genie Learn and we, we captured what the state was before when it was out of compliance. Now in theory, I think I've changed a bunch of things. So let's do another Learn and I'm going to save it to a new directory instead of old directory. So it's going to do that same thing, SSH to all four. All right, so that's done. Now there's one more step I got to do, which is a diff. So those of you that are familiar with Linux or Unix, diff just says, take an old, take a new, tell me what's changed. But in this case, I can do it across the entire directory. So I'm going to say between all of my devices, if that's four or if that's 4,000 devices, tell me what changed between those two runs. And think about this, I'm doing configs, but if you did that on routing tables, and you have 100 routers in your network, I would do this before every maintenance I ever did. I would do a learn routes. If you're running BGP, learn BGP. And then afterwards, do the exact same thing. If you weren't touching BGP, you probably expect no difference. If there is, maybe you want to look closer and figure out what broke or what changed in your BGP table. Or maybe you just run it daily and you figure out if routes are coming on and off your network. You might want to know because maybe someone's injecting routes maliciously. So these could be really handy just pre-early warning systems. But I generated diffs on my config. So let's go ahead and open up um, router one because I already looked at that. So here is what it's saying. The nomenclature is plus means it's a line that appeared on the newer one. Uh, minus means it's gone away. So in this case, I fixed my domain name, I fixed my time zone, I fixed my NTP servers, I, I got rid of the old time zone, I got rid of the old domain name, um, I got rid of the old timestamp settings. So I now know exactly what changed on all four of those devices from my other script. So if you're doing a manual maintenance window, maybe you just want a snapshot before and after of what configs were changed that night. You save this off into a directory, and if nothing breaks, you're fine. You never have to look at it again. But if something broke, now you can go back and say exactly what changed, during that maintenance window, and you can try and figure out which step was the one that caused the network outage or some app to stop working. So does that make sense? Do you see how powerful, just without any code whatsoever, that single tool could actually really empower you to start learning programmability and understanding how it can work, and, it, and hopefully at least get you interested to maybe start exploring and say, okay, now I want to play with Ansible. Now I want to play with whatever tool you might feel most comfortable with. But this shows you the power that's there without actually having to learn how to code. And if you like how this works, it's all built on PyATS, so you could jump into Python and use PyATS's module within Python and have all the same functionality, but do it in a much more custom way. So I think it's a pretty powerful tool. I highly encourage you all, if you, if you learn nothing else from this event, go and just try this on your network. Put, build, put a few devices in and see what it can discover about your infrastructure. So I'll, oops, I'll leave some time for questions also, but I got to do my required slides. Surveys, surveys are very important. I'm one of the first talks for you probably this event, so I will, uh, I will tell you the same thing you're going to hear from everyone. If you guys don't do the surveys, I don't know whether we should do this talk ever again. If it's not good, I can't make it better if you don't tell me why. So all I ask is, I'm, I'm, I love if you give me negative feedback, but please give me something to improve. If you don't like the talk, tell me what you would have expected. Did I not position it properly in the description? Did I not cover it in enough depth for you? I want to improve. I always want to make these better. Um, I also happen to manage the content for the entire area now, so I need to know which of these talks are work, working and which aren't. So that's across all the talks you attend today. For DevNet particularly, I very much implore you to give me feedback. Um, and you, get, you can win a shirt, I think, or you get a shirt. I don't, uh, let's see. Uh, if you do four, you get a shirt. So that's an added bonus. Uh, other things you can do to continue your education, we got walk-in labs over there. Great opportunity to go try some of this stuff hands-on. Uh, there's other sessions here. That, I mean, this entire area is programmability. So every session is related to what we just talked about. You can do Meet the Engineer. I think there might still be some sessions, so you can go and try and book one. You can find me wandering in the halls all week. Um, I'm happy to have one-on-one -on -one discussions about everything I just talked about. And we got a ton of demos throughout this area. So Automation Journey is the one I'll call out. There's five stages, and it goes from virtual hardware to Pi ATS. It's got NSO, it's got Action Orchestrator, Workflow Engine, bunch of interesting stuff showing actual things that might be tangibly usable in your environment. 
So with that, anyone have questions? We do have a couple of minutes, so I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, no hard feelings. If you want to just come up and grab stickers if you want them, I'll put them uh, on the front here. Uh, but anyone have questions? If so, raise your hand and I, I'll have to repeat the question for everyone. No, you're all ready to go forth and program? Awesome. My job here is done then. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the show.